the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I, not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greeting. Our Father, help us to understand your word clearly not my words, but your word. Bless us as we meet together this morning around your word and its meaning. Amen. I notice that, uh, notice that there are some identical sentences here in the writing of the first book of John. To who did he write it? It was either to a fellowship of believers in those early days or it was to a very eminent lady and her children. The church and uh, church history and all of history is littered with godly women who have, who have won people to the Lord Jesus. And their home is just as much a church as any cathedral. And so it doesn't matter whether it was to a fellowship uh, or to a person or family. Uh, this reading from uh, the elderly John. He calls himself the elder. I uh, sympathise with him a little bit. He was probably over 90 when he wrote this letter. I notice that this book carries the same rebuke as John's first letter and Peter and Paul's writings warning of the rising heresies at that time and warning us especially toward the end of the age, warnings of heresies. The theme of the letter is really for truth's sake. Oh, friends and believers, I really need to emphasise that we need to consider truth is worth contending for. This applies to our lives, our marriage, our schools, our laws. The Bible says, watch your life and doctrine. Teach sound doctrine. Jesus said, if you love me, 
follow my teaching. Truth is one of God's absolutes. In our current society, truth is circumstantial or optional. Truth is, is malleable. Um, I think a good example of, of that I, I heard on the ABC. You'll get all the truth you need from the ABC. And I heard on another program that the uh, koala habitat is likely to be flooded on the whole eastern coast of Australia. So that means we'll all have to move up to Toowoomba because uh, that would be a lot of flooding. Truth, discernment today is about as popular as absolute truth and honesty. Oh, I love the programs of that brethren fellow, Martin Isles. The truth of it. I hope some of you watch his programs on YouTube. The truth of it. In the Western world, we are being conditioned to accept truth as being what you want it to be. And uh, truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. Um, look at that situation with uh, Israel Falau. He put up a portion of the scripture, which is truth, in his own time on a board, and uh, the media called it hate speech. Truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. This book, this book, is God's word. I love uh, Hudson Taylor called it a book of certainties. A book of certainties. God says what he means and he means what he says. John in this small letter uses the word truth five times. In just 12 verses, five times. He also uses the word love five times. Did you notice that? The emphasis very clearly is not love without truth and not truth without love. These two, love and truth, are inseparable in the Christian life. That doctrine is a final test of reality. In John's time, apostasy and false teaching were already casting a shadow over the early church. Oh, dear friends and fellow believers, book after book, Jesus and the New Testament writers all warn us about false teaching and doctrine, especially in the end of the age. What's your experience? What have you experienced in regard to false teaching? When talking with people, have you ever heard anybody say, oh, oh I just follow the golden rule? Ever heard anybody say something like that? Or, uh, uh, I follow God my way. One of my close friends uh, said to me one time, well, you've got your way and your opinion, we follow our way. That's false teaching. I've heard people say, oh, God is too loving to send anybody to hell. We need to be careful and watch. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my teaching. Not the teaching or the opinions of men. Not what some educated silly thinks Jesus meant or what the Bible says. We need to go back to the word of God continuously. Uh, some of you know that we collect books. I'm surprised at the false teaching material that has come to us 
in some libraries, even from the homes of some Christians. Uh, somebody has said, oh, but that's your opinion. Uh, Graham and Elizabeth, you make the decision. Not our decision. What does the Bible say? We had to discern the material that came to us. We had to judge the content because we dare not send false teaching to developing churches, to new Christians, to Bible school students in Africa or anywhere else. We are responsible for the material we send. And uh, somebody gave me this book just a short time ago. You can read the title, Conversations with God. We check every book we send out. And uh, when I had a look at this book, would we send it or what's it say? I want to thank the people that helped me write this book. Secondly, I want to thank all my spiritual teachers who include the saints and sages of all religions. Would you send that book to a new Christian? The saints and sages of all religions. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. So all the other religions, all their founders are dead. All their teaching is false. We dare not send that book to young Christians. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my teaching. I believe that there are Christians today who cannot be used to lead lost souls to the Lord because of their reading and listening material. What does your mind and spirit feed on? From Mark's Gospel, Jesus said, Consider carefully what you hear. They didn't have lots of books in those days. Maybe we could add, consider what you read. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus taught, therefore, consider carefully how you listen. I don't think they had TV in Jesus' day. Maybe we could add, uh, listen and look at. I could take you to a home where the wife spent a lot of time looking at garbage stuff on TV that upset her husband. He occupied in something else in his workshop or somewhere and uh, he didn't want a bar of that worldly stuff and it finished up in a divorce. Consider carefully what you hear. Consider carefully how you listen and in Luke's gospel see that the light within you is not darkness dear friends the word of God this book is not negotiable you can't just pick out a verse or two and reject a verse or two or the rest look at the seriousness that John instructs us toward false teachers in our reading this morning. He said, don't even offer them the normal courtesies of life. This is serious stuff. This is not playing games. This is not playing church. The Bible is very firm in dealing with false teaching and false teachers. Oh, but there's one verse in this little book. 
that stands out as vitally important in this passage. What do you think it is? Which verse do you, would you consider is one of the main messages of the book? This God-breathed statement we cannot ignore. In practice, it touches every Christian or should. What verse do you think I refer to? Kevin, in his message two weeks ago, read these words. This is the love of God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. And in our reading this morning, God has put central to the 12 verses this verse. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. I looked up a heap of translations uh, at home and I found that every one of them said exactly the same thing. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. Oh, what a wonderful heritage we've got today as we look back on history. And uh, we are so blessed with people who have followed God's commands and followed the Bible. Have you read about uh, Mary Slessor or William Carey the bootmaker? Have you read their stories? Have you read about Charles Wesley and things that happened in his life? Or Corrie ten Boone, the clockmaker from uh, the Netherlands? I, I could list a huge pile of people, of saintly men and women who have loved people into the kingdom that we look forward to. What wonderful opportunities we have today also. I wonder how many of you have got a little picture on the side of your fridge of a foster child in another country and you're sending some funds to uh, see that they're educated in a Christian school. What a, a privilege to share a little bit of our life with them that they might grow up in a Christian atmosphere and learn to love the Lord. And who knows, but your prayer might mean that that person becomes a leader and a soul winner for the Lord Jesus. You won't see that very well from where you are. It's the picture of a young lady from India. And years ago, we had the privilege of supporting her, her church in uh, Mizoram couldn't find the money. They had too many missionaries out on the field. Um, and we were able to support her, I think, something like $10 a week or something. She went from India, where she was trained in uh, Delhi University. She went to... Um, names go out of my head. <laughs> Manila, Philippines with Far East Broadcasting Company. And she was part of the English team, the English language ministry, back to India. And she was on air every day, reaching an estimated three million people to the FEBC broadcast. What a thrill to have had a share in her ministry. We actually brought her to Australia for a month and I carted around Brisbane and parts of Queensland uh, and she told her story. And what a, th what a joy, what a thrill it's been. And uh, we can have our own missionary. If we can't go ourselves, we can support a full-time broadcaster or pastor in a village for a very small sum of money each week and they can be living in a place that we wouldn't want to go and they'll be 
they can be winning souls and we've got a share in it. We can, uh, we can provide a... We can provide a little radio or a... Uh, a that's got the scripture on it. Testament, the Holy Bible, today's new international version. Read by Tyler Butterworth and Susan Sheridan. There was a church in America that sent 100,000 of these to all the camps of people coming out of Syria. The people, mostly Muslims, had the Bible in their own language with one of those. What an amazing ministry. I heard only a week or so ago that somebody, it might be the same church, has sent 25,000 audio Bibles into Afghanistan. What a wonder. What a thrill to be part of something like that. We can provide a radio or audio Bible or vital literature like we send to build national churches. There are amazing opportunities today and to suit everyone's bank account. Jesus' last command, can somebody tell me what Jesus' last words were? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey me. Jesus does not say, would you like to? Or, uh, I've got a suggestion or uh, an option would be, no, no. This is not an option we can send to the waste paper basket. I don't know if you're interested in history or not. <laughs> Some of us weren't keen on it at school. Look at the mess. Look at the terrible mess and the suffering problems in the history of Israel. What a terrible time they have had, seemingly from the time they came out of Egypt. What happened? Did God fail them? Were his promises not, not sufficient? Why have they suffered so much and still are and still will until the Lord comes back? Why? Why are they suffering? I was reading in the Minor Prophets last week and Hosea said, My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. Isaiah wrote the reason. I made you a life, sorry, I made you a light for the Gentiles that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth but they chose other interests and they failed God's purpose. Israel's future is quite clear in prophecy. What of the church? What of the church across Australia today? Are we, are we the Laodicean church? The uh, is the church in Australia akin to the last of the churches written to in Revelation chapter 3? Oh, thank God we've got a, a history we can look back on where there have been faithful Christians and active men and women of God. Thank God for the Welsh revival. I don't know if you've ever read some of the history of... Uh, what happened in England but it changed the Western world thank God for the Wesleys that stirred up the other churches and took Bible teaching to America there was a time when I heard somebody say America can't fail yet 
because they've got so many missionaries around the world and God loves missionaries. Thank God for the faithful missionaries through the 1800s and again in the last centuries that took the gospel to China and Africa, the Pacific, South America. Oh, what hardship and what suffering some of them went through and sacrifice in their love for Jesus and following his command. But what stories there are for us of John Payton and George Muller and Hudson Taylor and Robert Bowman and hundreds, no thousands more, men and women of God who simply followed what God gave them to do. They took the love that John here writes about, love for the Saviour and love for the lost and multitudes of the lost were saved. Many of these people lost their lives. But what of their future? When we all have to give an account before the Lord of the gifts that he's given us and the work that he had prepared for us if we haven't followed it. We have to give an account before the Lord of the gifts he's given us and the work he's prepared for us. I notice in uh, Ephesians, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We need to be obedient to that. The last 60 or uh, 60 to 80 years, I guess that's about the lifetime for a lot of us here this morning. There we've seen increasingly available wonderful aids to reach the lost around the world. Things like radio, TV, there's all sorts of ways that we can serve the Lord and uh, do what he wants us to do. I was in the FEBC, Far East Broadcasting Company, radio studios in uh, Thailand. The, uh, the office there prepare programs in 22 languages going out to 22 different tribal groups in Thailand and Laos. And uh, they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of people. They only send out about a half hour program in each language each day. Those programs would, would be sent out in the morning to the tribal group in their time zone when the people are uh, getting out of bed and preparing their snack breakfast there'd be a, a radio program to listen to and then the same program would be broadcast again in the evening when they've had their meal and sitting around their campfire or in their village uh, just a half hour program changing each day in their language from a person from that language group FEBC do not use cross-cultural teaching. They only have people from that language group that have been converted, they train them and they send the gospel back to their own people. When I was in Thailand at that time, I'd learnt of the half hour program a day going to the Kamu tribal people in Laos you cannot and haven't been able to send missionaries to Laos for a long time. But this half hour program went in morning and night. They counted up the letters that had come back from that tribal group the year before I was there. And in the one year they found that 
6,720 Camus tribes people had come to faith in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It costs about $40 a month to keep one of those broadcasters behind the desk and behind the microphone. What a thrill for somebody to have a share in such a ministry. It costs so little to support a broadcaster. Or, I talked to Jacob in Myanmar. He took me out to a village where a young man was going to start a, a church and a school. They start a little kindergarten first and it grows and grows until they've got a, a church with the, the mums and even the dads coming to see what the kids are learning. And I said to Jacob, what does it cost for this trained Bible school student to come out to a village, build a little house, start a little garden and start a church? Oh, he said, we, we hope to send him $40 a month. $40, $10 a week. I thought of pastors in Australia. There would be many in Australia on pretty good salaries with a good home and car and everything else. And they've got a 20-minute sermon once a week. And I think of some of these people that we can support that have got hours of working with the people to win them to the Lord and show them what it is to be a Christian. Thank God for organisations like Open Doors and Compassion or Barnabas Fund, support to persecution, to persecuted Christians in so many countries. Thank God for their ministries. We need to get behind them and pray and support. That's what Jesus said we were to do. Thank God for Far East Broadcasting Company and Transworld Radio and Sat7 TV reaching Muslim countries with the gospel. Do you know at one stage there were so many Christians, so many people becoming Christians in Iran that some of the pastors stopped preaching gospel messages they couldn't handle the number of people coming to the Lord. Let me say this. The ministry of these organisations is very, very professional. It's very, they are very biblical. They are very much blessed of God and they are very, very effective. I must stop. I haven't gone through that whole book yet. If this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. Fellow believer, where do you fit in? What is your involvement? supporting and praying for one or more ministries that is taking the gospel across the street and across the sea. Uh, anybody heard of Oswald Smith? Not many. Oswald Smith was the pastor of a large missionary sending church in Canada. They sent out many, many missionaries around the world when it wasn't so easy to send missionaries. His preaching in different parts of Canada, the States, England and Australia had many, many hundreds. In fact, I would say there were many thousands of people heard his ministry and trained to be a missionary and went out to the mission field. Listen to what he wrote. 
unless every Christian and unless every church is committed to missionary enterprise, they are not in the will of God. Unless every Christian and unless every church is committed to missionary enterprise, they are not in the will of God. The aged Apostle John that we read this morning puts it this way. This is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. Say it with me. Let's all say it together. This is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. Have you got your finger in the pie of some ministry? Are you supporting what God wants you to support? Have you had the thrill and the joy of being part of what God is doing in some other part of the world? Thank God for the two men here that are using their retirement skills to write scripture material and send it to Grace Printing House in Myanmar and it's going out all over the country and I'm getting sometimes two and three emails a week to tell me of the blessing of that material. There is a thrill, there is a, a joy in doing what God wants us to do. And there's the eternal rewards where we're going to face the Lord with what we've done, with the gifts he's given us, the funds he's provided, the uh, skills and uh, what we are. We don't have to worry about our repented sins. They're forgiven. But we do have to answer for the gifts that he's given us and how we've used them. Oh, forget Graham Furlong speaking. Forget me. This is God speaking. This is love that we walk in obedience to his commands. I intended to say at the beginning and I was a little bit offbeat. Uh, years ago, a lot of preachers used to start with a text. They'd have a, a text at the beginning of their sermon and uh, sometimes that text was a little bit like a, a coat hook. Uh, the hook was there and everything got put on the coat hook but so you, never, you never saw the hook anymore. <laughs> All you saw was the coats. And... Uh, some of the texts used to be a bit like that. But we've got a text for today. I'm being old-fashioned at my age. Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's what James said in James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Oh, I wish we were a bigger crowd here this morning. We're going to sing the next hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. I wish we had a, uh, a huge pipe organ or maybe a, an orchestra or a thousand voices that were all ready to sing. But let's stand and sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We're going to sing just three verses. Verse 1, verse 3, verse 6. I hope, oh, I hope you can sing verse 6. They're pumping up the organ. <laughs> 